this is a, a fairly interesting show. Um, it's in, in two locations. It's at the Metropolitan and the Vilcek Foundation, which is um, on 20, at 21 East 70th Street. You have to um, line up an appointment to go and you get a guided tour. They're usually at 12 and 2.30 or something like that. Let me talk about this show first. And, you know, I'll talk more about the Vilcek Foundation as we go along. Um, this show is a, a rather unique exhibition for the Met because it's really a community-based curated Native American exhibition of pottery. So um, they drew the curators of the show from the community, uh, the Pueblo um, community. And um, um, it was pulled together from the Indian Arts Research Center in Santa Fe and the Vilcek Foundation. Um, it's really the first time that they've ever done anything like this. So the exhibition kind of amplifies the stories and histories and tradition of over 20 tribal communities. Um, and the, the people who will be guiding you at the Vilcek Foundation are members of that community, are, are actually some of the curators. Um, so there are several um, of the potters that are that are um, represented in the in these shows that that have really international reputations now. Um, so what I'll start with is, is we are living on um, a land that's called America at this stage of the game, but the, the name that it was given through various tribes that lived here before the um, Europeans came, the basically the the um, the land was called Turtle Island, actually after a myth that that um, um, a young woman was cast out of of heaven, um, swooped up by by geese, landed landed on the back of a turtle, and and through um, the efforts of the of the sea animals was was given sand from the bottom of the sea and that's what created the earth that we that we live on so turtle island was created through that method and there's a bunch of different myths from different tribes that that kind of relate to the same story so um, the, the water jar that we're looking at on the, on the right, um, is a terrace water jar, jar symbolizing steps into the Hopi Kavas, which were the sacred, sacred, um, spaces. Um, and the symbols on, on the water on the water thing are basically clouds, mountains, and and an ocean or serpent um, stream water. Um, very <laughs> important to uh, that location in the world. Um, so, all right. Here's here is the exhibit that's on at the Vilcek or part of the exhibit that's on the Vilcek Foundation. Um,
And this is one of the community curators actually in the process of setting up the, the exhibition there. So the pottery on view ranges from um, 600 AD. Actually, the the peak period for the for the the early period for the Pueblo um, uh, pottery is from about 600 to about 1300. AD, um, and then and then it it picked up again in the mid 1800s, and basically they the potters at that time began to integrate the symbols from the earlier period into their pots at that time, which is really interesting. Um, You know this this piece. Um, they cultivated turkeys, and uh, this is this is a uh, uh, this strange bird is is representing a turkey, and a actually there's a tale of this um, uh, turkey girl who is some kind of a variation on the Cinderella story. Uh, So this is this is from the you know 1870 1880. All right, here we go. Uh, this this piece is is a really uh, great example of of something which I'm going to talk a lot about, which is the isometric design. Um, it really is about positive and negative shapes. Let me see. If I I've got a little definition here that, that I'll pull out at this point. Isometric design is basically three-dimensional drawing on a two-dimensional surface. It creates an optical illusion. You can see how the shapes overlap one another and, and create this sense of dimensionality. The interesting part is you're creating a three-dimensional drawing or painting on a three-dimensional surface. So it makes it um, a, a, a double, um, how shall I say, uh, doubly difficult, <laughs> a real challenge to actually draw those lines and have, have these things come out. They did this without a pencil. So basically they used a liner brush to to draw these lines in, and it it took a a good deal of skill to be able to have this complex design end up working correctly when you get to the other side of the pot. How they did that, the skill that went into this is really incredible, actually, when you stop to think about it. So this is a really ancient piece. It's 1050 to 1300 AD. Um, okay. And um, this polychrome water jar by Nampeo um, is actually the, the people of the American Southwest believe in a complex mythology around the, the vit vitality of the unpredictable desert landscape, and especially the life-giving power of rainwater and mountains. Their hand-built pottery features imagery that reflects this deep spirituality. Nampeo was one of the first Southwest potters to become recognized, a recognized name outside of her Hopi community, and is renowned for her technical skills and aesthetic sensibility. Her career as a fine artist was supported by private and institutional collectors. On the vessels created, uh, created for such clientele, she depicts spirit beings with variations of headdresses 
and colors in an arching rectangular double line frame. So you can see one of those one of those characters up, up above on the left. Um, so I'm going to talk more about Nampeo. She she was really um, the the excavations, the archaeological excavations started in the early 1900s. So that unearthed a lot of images that hadn't been seen um, by the um, in in this kind of volume by the potters that were around at that time. So it it very much it very much opened up inspiration for new explorations. Um, let's see. Okay. And there is Nampeo. So she lived from 1859 to 1942 um, and really is credited with a revival in, in the tradition. Um, and you can see these shapes are quite remarkable, actually. The, the, um, the, the shape of the painted object or the painted figure and the space around it are both really interactive and, and kind of makes the eye flip back and forth between the white and the black and the lines. There, there's a lot of optical illusions in these pieces. The map on the left really gives you some idea of the location And again, these are, you know, great examples of this isomeric um, design um, and the, the interaction, you know, the overlapping of forms and the sense of dimensionality in, in, the, in the pot is really interesting and very vibrant and, and it, it kind of shimmers in a way. So what do you see? The classic face and candlestick or vase um, illusion exemplifies the amb ambiguous figure ground relationship. Because the two objects are the same size, your mind has trouble deciding what to see. So you see two faces, you see the, the candlestick or goblet or vase, whatever you want to call it, but you can't see both of them at the same time. Either you see two faces or you see the, the goblet. It's hard to take in, it's hard for your brain to take in both of those things at the same time. The relationship can flip back and forth in your mind. Focus your gaze inherently, uh, the focus of your gaze inherently becomes the figure, while the area around it uh, becomes the ground. Uh, let's see, this was during the 1910s that this was explored by um, Gestalt psycho psychologist. Um, let's see. So, um, can you still recognize the faces and candlesticks? Optical illusions require instant recognition for them to function. So it's it's a little bit harder to see the face goblet in when the orientation is different, when they're upside down or sideways. So this gives you some idea when I'm talking about the figure ground relationship in these designs, this is kind of what's going on. You can't focus on both the light and the dark at the same time. Um, they kind of flip back and forth. Um, and this is a really, you know, lovely example of, of a very ancient mug 
1150 to 1300. I'm going to actually, let's see if I can do this pop up the zoom so that you can see the inside of this a little bit. I mean, it's a little blurry, but you get the idea. Basically, all of these pots are coil pots. They are not thrown on, on the wheel. They are, they are coiled, wrapped around. And you can see inside this, this mug some of the leftovers of the coil in there, basically. Um, and the same thing is true, I believe, in this this little mug over here, yeah, you can see you can see the linear elements of the coil still on the inside of the pot. On the outside, they smooth it off, but on the inside, it's a little rougher, and you can still see the coils. Larry, anyone... we have a question. Okay, what's the question? Okay, is optical illusions only Pueblo art or other Native American work as well? The other Native American work as well, and it is universal, and I will get to that. But basically, the, this kind of patterning is inherent in many different cultures. Uh, if you look at Greek vases, they have the same kind of figure ground business going on. If you look at um, um, Islamic sculpture, I mean, not sculpture, I mean, pottery and mosaics and things like that, you'll see the same figure ground. If you look at a rose, rose um, stained glass window in Europe, again, figure, figure ground figures prominently in all of that. Okay, so good question. Thank you. <laughs> okay, uh, so why do we see spatial illusions? Human, humans perceive spatial relationships when we see small objects within larger spaces. We understand a small form to be figures or objects, and they seem to appear in front of larger objects that we interpret as ground, as backgrounds. Artists and psychologists have used the term figure and ground relationships to describe this perception. To our eyes, the white figures seem closer and the black figures uh, than the black figures, but both figures seem closer than the gray background. Okay, so you can see that in action right here. And this wonderful old jar is, you know, basically 10, 10, 50 to 13, you know, back there. It's really back there. Um, one of the things I wanted to talk about with this is, you know, you see the spirals and things like that. We're going to talk a lot more about the spirals in, in a minute or two, but what I wanted to talk about also is how these are painted on. So it says clay and paint. Well, paint is not real durable. What what they what I believe they did, and I I don't have this confirmed. I should have checked it, but I believe that the paint that they made up was something called slick, which is is basically taking a, a slurry a liquid of the of the clay and mixing pigment in with that and that's how they how they made their their paint and then when these things were fired the the um the paint would adhere to the to the the uh pot more you know more permanently more durably Okay, so um, natural forms, uh, both organic and mineral or crystalline structures were observable um, 
and and these patterns were something which would have been absorbed by the by the the um, indigenous peoples, but this is true all around the world. Basically, these structures are something which are visible to us and patterns that are used to ornament pots and and um, and clothing and all these different forms of decoration are drawn from the these natural elements um, unity and diversity aspects of the golden section can be found in nature on a micro and macro cosmic level and so this is this is really again this is part of the spirituality that's involved for the the uh the pueblo when they're when they're talking about their pots and doing this figure ground business it's it's actually talking about the the seen and the unseen the 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 binding of the old earth and the clay mother um, for them are really the spiritual essence of of what of what they're what they're after and what's actually resonant in these in these pots. And so, what is the golden ratio? The golden ratio is also known as the golden number, golden proportion, divine proportion, um, is a ratio between two numbers that equals approximately 1.68, usually written by the Greek letter phi. Um, it's strongly associated with the Fibonacci sequence. The numbers uh, the, ser the series of numbers wherein each number is added to the last. The Fibonacci numbers are 0, 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, and so on. Um, so this, this ratio can be found in, in natural forms, seashells, um, and natural forms like these. So some aspect of the golden section is in each of these spiraled elements um, and broken down into these, these linear, and I'll show you more of this, into these more linear elements too. So let me go here and just give you a second to absorb this. Now this is in in classical architecture, um, in the in the Greek and Roman classical architecture, the golden section, the golden proportions are you know you know the uh, the old Da Vinci um, figure with his with his arms spread. Again, it's the golden the golden section is is in that that figure. Um, there are a lot of examples of this. And these forms all relate to that in, in, some, in some way. It's, it's sections of the golden section broken out. Um, and it's a very intuitive thing. The, 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 the um, mathematics were not worked out before these people went in and made their art. It just is a very elegant form that that is kind of an uh, an intuitive thing that we that we uh, as humans gravitate to. And you know, here is really um, the breakdown of 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 sections of the golden section that that go into making these really elegant shapes in inside the pots that we're looking at. So 
spirals. Ancestral Pueblo artists painted a variety of spiral forms. These examples include both geometric and curvilinear spirals. These examples begin with simple spirals and move to examples of interlocking spirals with liminal spaces, then end with stepping stepped forms. Curvilinear forms can be difficult, a difficult motif to paint with even spacing. However, rectilinear, rectilinear spirals as geometric forms seem easier to paint using the brush made from the fibrous filaments of a yucca plant leaf. This tool is pulled like a modern stripping brush um, rather than back and forth scrubbing in a scrubbing motion. So I have a couple of examples of, of uh, these types of stripping brushes. And, you know, basically you can see how if you pull that, you're going to get a, 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 an even line, a better even line. Um, and rather than trying to paint it directly straight up and down, you pull the brush and it, it, it will give you a, a nice even line if you practice a lot. And these guys practiced a lot. Or these women, excuse me, practiced a lot. For the most part, a lot of the, the pottery, at least in the ancient um, tradition, were done by women. Um, okay. And um, let's see. All right, this, this jug on, on the left is a really nice example of coincidence or coalescence of edge. If you look at how the handle is on, on, that, on the jug and you notice how from the way the shot is, the, the bottom of the, the handle kind of goes right into the, the curve of the spiral that goes onto the jug and the top edge of the handle coalesces with the with the mark that goes into the spiral up at the top of the brim of the of the jug. I th I threw this story tile in just because I love it, uh, and you know it's turtles and turtles were uh, very um, reliable and related again to water, um, and you know there there are these. Um, uh, lightning strikes uh, in in these on these mountain images um, on on both corners of the of the tile. Really fun though, that thing. Uh, okay, so this this shows you the the process of of how they actually took and began the patterns. So if you follow from the left to the to the right, you can get how basically they use they use these these S curves to to start the structure and then filled in on the inside and slowly built up the outline of the pattern. And then this shows examples of both figure and ground of, of the, the lines filled in in the pattern and the outside of the pattern filled in with the, with the pattern remaining white on the one on the end. Um, on, the, on the bottom, you see this, this really lovely ancient bowl um, and it really gives you the sense of that figure ground business in a very simple way. You know, which is it? Is it black on white or white on black? Uh, we, we probably know that it was painted with the black on it, but, but the shape 
shifts back and forth if you if you look at it that way. And this is again an early 1150 to 1250. Okay. And these exquisite earthenware pots, the Zuni and Pueblo people um, made in different sizes and proportions. The outline of, of uh, three of these are down below in the illustration. And you can see how basically the proportions are very similar. The shape ends up being quite different in, in a certain way, but, but the, the rhythm, the, the design, the harmonious quality of the thing as it shrinks down is still there. And if you want to read this stuff, basically, you're going to have to come back to the, the uh, um, the recording of this and stop the the recording at, at this point so you can read all the the information but there are parallels between music and and logarithmic spirals that that really relate to the golden the golden um, rectangle All right, uh, ancestral Pueblo people used these large jars to store dried food, freely painted the design features in abstract black forms in, in, in white that appears basically what, what's happening is, is the hatching and all that stuff adds uh, a kind of dimensionality and shimmer to the to the thing as your eyes popping back and forth between the black and the white. Really interesting abstract forms. So this is a contemporary basket, okay, a basket bowl. And um, one of the things, one of the reasons I brought this in is basically um, uh, the, the pots were an outgrowth of the design of, of the baskets. The baskets were used first and then, and then the innovations of clay came in. Um, so basically, the the designs in in the 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 baskets were translated into forms in in the pots. And this Zuni stew bowl, interesting, interesting notion. The 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 beautiful design on the inside of the stew bowl. If you think about the functionality of this thing, basically, they would make a big stew inside this inside this pot, so you wouldn't see that design when it was full of food. So why did they do that? Well. In the process of eating, they would they would all be sitting around the bowl, reaching in and and taking taking the stew. And as they were eating, as they were sitting around the bowl, the image would reveal itself. So by the time they were finished with the meal, the bowl, this beautiful image, would emerge out of, out of the out of the process of eating. Okay, so this is this is a intact storage jar with lid. Many of the storage jars did have lids. They, you know, they break or they get lost in in, in over time. 
but this one this one really shows what that looks like. Larry, yes, a per, uh, somebody had a comment. The pottery mm -hmm. reminds me of a zen of zen tangle. The designs, lines, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. limited uh, color use was in tangle derived from the pottery. And I don't know what Zentangle is. Oh, uh, Zentangle is it's a it's a um a kind of drawn puzzle game that that people play. And I I I wouldn't say that it was just from the Pueblo pottery. I think that those those motifs are in a lot of different uh cultures. So yes, it is it is from this, but um, but no, at the same time, uh, I think, I think they, they probably drew it from those kind of late motifs that are in all cultures. So that, that the drawing, the patterns and things like that. Now, I don't know the Zen tangle that you may be doing may be derived directly from the, 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 uh, Pueblo pottery. I haven't seen the one that you're working with, so I don't know. Okay, so now we're getting to Maria Martinez, who is is actually a, just a master potter, um, really innovative. She, um, uh, let's see, I've got some stuff. Okay, all right, I got some stuff on her. Um, she. She was, she kind of innovated this technique of, of, of doing these black pots with the matte and gloss um, uh, surface. Um, and the, the pots were made from clay that had a lot of iron in them so that when they were fired, they turned this black, this beautiful black quality um so maria martinez was really um her her dates are are um from the late 1800s into the 20th century she, i believe it was 1887 to 1980 that she would but I'll have those dates on the, uh, another one of the slides, which I'll push on to right now. This is this is examples of a bunch of her her pieces. Um, she worked basically in in 1908, 1909. There was a um, uh, a new director of the Museum of New Mexico that. Um, that really brought to the museum prehistoric pottery techniques and asked Maria to, to who was already reputed as, a, as an excellent potter, um, if she would make full scale examples from the, the, the pot shards that they had um to create this kind of polychrome ware and she and her husband julian uh worked together he um she created the pots and he would would paint them um and here they are together um larry yes with the question the symmetry uh roundness of these pots are amazing all without machines or other aids Yes. Yeah. Yes. And, and that's, that's her, I guess her. This is exactly where the where the where that golden mean comes into this. The elegance of the pots echo that that resonance. They've got that in them. And she was just a master. You know, that they're they're really sought after at this point. Yeah, there we go. 1887 to 1980. And there's the lady herself. Her husband died in the mid '60s, I believe, um, but other members of her family worked with her, um, and 
the tradition goes on. Actually, she she has passed on, but her family continues to make pots. And the same is true of Mempeo's uh, family. They are still engaged in 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 uh, traditional pottery. And that that's an interesting notion. The thing with with this tradition is is yes, you follow examples from the past and integrate them into your pots, but there is also the change, the individuality, the contemporaneousness of of the work. These pots are really different from some of the ancient pots that we that that I've shown you. Um, they they are a direct direct lineage, but they are unique. And the individuality of each of the potters is definitely something that shows in these pieces. Larry, do you know how old she was when she did this work? Oh, you mean this? I think you're talking about a range from from when she was young in her in her probably in her 30s, 40s, up until she was, uh, what was it, 93 when she died? So uh, <laughs> there's a range. They look to me like they're, they're in their uh, late 40s, early 50s in, in these pictures. And here is, again, like I said, this tradition goes on. This is not a Martinez pot. This is this is a a um, a pot that was a jar that was made in 1940, um, but following that tradition. Now, the interesting part about this is is basically um, the bear bear claw, the bear paw. This motif, this symbol, um, is the symbol of authority, strength, of of leadership. So there's kind of animal spirits that are that are integrated into these these pots too. Which whenever there's the the animal symbols that show up on the on the pots, there's there's a there's a mythology that goes along with them. Okay, and. This is, uh, you know, the bat. You can see the you can see the ears and the eyes and the wings on on the one on the on the on the pot on the left, and and again you've got this checkerboard. Um, the checkerboard actually, let me see. I've got I've got some information about these things. The, the you know the checkerboard actually um, kind of correlates to to corn. And and it was a common motif. That grid is a common motif. Um, it represents kind of like the primary st staple of the Pueblo life for over two thousand years. So it's a symbol of happiness, of fertility, of health. Um, and then you know the the um, the bat is actually in their mythology a symbol of of good fortune, um, and then there's this this uh, uh, flowers in the deer's house, which is really beautiful. Again, the, this figure ground business going on, these squirrels. Um, let me let me talk a little bit about this deer with the arrow going into it. Now, when I first saw it, I thought, oh yeah, you know, it's one of those rituals where you kind of um, uh, imagine the animal that you want to capture um, speared and, and brought back to the, the village. But they came up with a very different kind of notion. The arrows usually imply force or movement or direction. When displayed with animals, they represent the heart line that shows the pathway of breath or the life force of the animal spirit. So the deer represents abundance, family protection, and speed. 
So there's a number of different things going on in there. It's not just the shaman drawing the drawing the animal to to the home. It represents something quite different and and really interesting to you know find find those little pieces of information <laughs> while I'm digging around in these in these uh, archaeological digs. Okay, and this is a double lobe canteen. Um, from 1860, I mean, basically, you know, you can see that this would be a uh, fit over the shoulder so you could carry it when you're trudging through the desert and things like that. Um, ah, okay. And um, the turtle, long life, preservation, um, Perseverance. Um, so this is actually a contemporary piece. It's from 1960. Um, and there's a number of really fanciful pieces in this show that are that are contemporary pieces. I didn't take shots of many of them, but um, oh, and the 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 pot that's on that's on the right that that um, it, the carved red areas you can see the flicks of mica that shiny quality where where the the uh clay is gouged out is embedded in the in the uh clay and again this is fanny nampeo this is the nampeo tradition she um she lived from 1900 to 1987, um, one, of, one of Nampeo's daughters. Um, and this, this jar was made in, um, in 19, the 1980s. They don't have the exact date, but you can see the family tradition goes on. And these two are really contemporary um, pots. The, um, the seed jar um, is from 1980. Um, and again, really fanciful um, animal spirits. Um, and the, the one on the, on the right is, uh, is really a contemporary pot. Um, and this one's not in the show. The almost everything else that I've included in this is is in either in the Metropolitan show, which was partially from the Vilcek collection, and and the pieces that are at the Vilcek Foundation. Um, and you can you can actually make reservations, make an appointment at the Vilcek Foundation. It's not real hard to do. Um, and I we we tried to get there last week, and things came up that I I couldn't make it. But we did get to see this wonderful show at at the Metropolitan. Um, if you do get to the Metropolitan, you can go up into the into the American Wing, which is upstairs, and see the Impressionist pieces that I was doing a couple of weeks ago. Um, and uh, and there's there's also the wonderful um, uh, Matisse Durand um, show on at the Metropolitan, and the Manet and Degas. So. There's a lot to see. If you haven't been to the Met, there's a lot there. The Vilcek Foundation would be very interesting to go to. Uh, they, you know, they, as I said, the, the curators of the show, I think, are the ones that will be the guides through it. So you can ask all kinds of questions of them. Um, interesting. Um, all right. So. Uh, Painted Reflections, a virtual symposium for new understanding of ancestral Pueblo art is on YouTube. Really good talk. 
Uh, it's two and a half hours long. You're probably not going to get through all of that, but it's well worth it if you can. But the first half hour talks about this business of iso isometric design and and the figure ground business in in some more depth. So uh, that's it for this week. Um, in 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 a couple of weeks, on I believe it's December fifteenth, um, we're going. I'm going to go to the Morgan. There's a Tiepolo show there, which is a wonderful place to go, uh, and a beautiful, beautiful drawings in in that show. So, okay, okay. All right. Thank you all. Thank you, Larry. It was wonderful. I loved yeah. it.